Okay, well, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Hannah Darlin, who's going to be the first speaker, who's going to speak about birth at the time of COVID-19, which you know, birth carries on whatever goes on in the rest of the world. Uh, and mo many of you will know of Hannah. If you're a tweeter, you'll know about Hannah. And if you're a midwife, you'll know about Hannah. Um, and so we're so thrilled that she's joining us from Australia today. She's a professor of midwifery and discipline leader of midwifery and associate dean. I don't know how you fit all that in, Hannah, in the School of Nursing Midwifery. She's been a midwife for 30 years and still practices. And in fact, I'm sure she'll share with you, but she's in where she practices, which is fantastic. She's a prolific publisher. And she, in 2019, she was awarded a member of the Order of Australia, which is a huge honor. That's the AM after her name in the Queen's Birthday Honours list for her significant service to midwifery, nursing and medical education and research. Um, and she's obviously a very influential and wonderful person. But I don't want to say any more. Her bio, just as all the speakers' bios, are available online. So please do visit there as well. So welcome, Hannah. We're thrilled you're with us. The floor is yours. Thank, <laughs> thank you so much, um, Sue. And thank you for that very warm welcome and I sure hope I live up to uh, to that. I'm just going to share slides now so hopefully that all looks good for you all the way from Australia. The delay hopefully hasn't happened um, and I'm from you know New South Wales so I'm from that other Wales which we were actually named after you so it feels like there's a, a real connection with with us um, today and uh, as um, Sue said I'm in my consulting room as well as my my office so uh, this is real it's not one of those you know fake images that uh, get put up this is me in the raw so I'm really honored to um, be talking to you today about birth in the time of COVID. Uh, this is a study that has basically grown, like so many things this year, where we've moved at the rate of knots. Um, the virus has shown us our capacity, shown us our innovation. And um, I don't know about any of you, but I have never been busier in my life. And um, it's a different kind of busy, though. So I want to talk a bit about our study, but I also want to talk about some provoking things around human rights as well. So what a year has it been? We began our year full of fire and smoke, and we are probably heading back into that season now. Uh, we then had this little virus that came and basically managed to stop the world. We learned different ways of trying to connect with each other. I frankly miss the hugging and the kissing. I sure hope we haven't forgotten how to do that when we come back to that possibility. We saw some fairly devastating glimpses as to what birth might be when it initially came out um, in China. We learnt that masks be can become a fashion icon and, um, you know, it's quite extraordinary what you see people doing with their masks. And, of course, we saw the aviation industry virtually come to a standstill. Uh, it's been an extraordinary year and I'm sure in history, um, in years to come, we're going to reflect on this year. And I'm hoping we learn lessons, both the good and the bad, because I want to point out both today because I think there has been some good and I think we need to acknowledge that and learn from that as, as humans. So connection, as Brene Brown says, is what we are here, why we are here, we are hardwired to connect with others. And as humans, we need connection. And so what has happened in 2020 has really challenged that in ways that in our living memory, we have not experienced, even though we do know there have been other times in history where this um, connection has been severed. But in our time in history, we have not had this happen to the extent that we have seen in 2020. However, in our time in history, um, we do have all those wonderful things like social media and the ability to be connected all over the world in conferences like this. So we're also extraordinarily lucky um, to be at this point in history with this um, pandemic happening. But having a baby, as all of you would know listening, whether you're mothers or whether you're midwives or whether you're other maternity health workers, is when this need for connection is at its highest. So what's happening out there? 
what's happening now and what are the potential implications for the future? And that's what we are really interested in looking at in our birth in the time of COVID study, otherwise affectionately known as hashtag BITOC, for those of you who are into the, the world of hashtags. So it isn't known how COVID-19 will affect pregnant women, uh, new mothers, babies, midwives, midwifery students within those health systems dealing with the pandemic. And we're making decisions with little idea as to the long-term consequences. And we're also making decisions in a medicalized patriarchal framework. And I wanna address both of these in my talk today. So we have a patchwork of inconsistent policies. Um, we, I'm sure it's similar that you have the same happening in the UK, but we, first of all, you know, you could only have one support person in some hospitals, you could have two support people, uh, there were people sneaking support people up back corridors, hiding them under, under drapes, there was a whole bunch of variation going on, we had hospitals one kilometre away from each other that had different rules. We had huge PPE variations. Um, in some of the interviews I've been doing with midwives, there was even the good PPE was reserved for the doctors and the other PPE went to the midwives. So we've started to reveal some very interesting things in our allocations. We had no partners at ultrasounds. And, you know, that actually ended up being a very big deal when women were being told their baby was no longer alive and they had no one to share that with. Uh, we offered on one hand and restricted on the other water birth. You know, we even had a hospital in New South Wales when Victoria blew up. And as you will all know, Victoria's had a second wave. There was a restriction on water birth, which I don't think was logical. But what was really illogical was the fear that then permeated into New South Wales, where people started putting tape around the bath nozzles to stop water birth happening. So we've had the shutdown and the expansion of birth centres. Our, our only freestanding birth centre in New South Wales was turned into a COVID clinic. Um, we've closed home birth programs and we've expanded home birth programs. And meanwhile, there's been about a tripling in the um, seeking of home birth from women. You know, we've argued for skin to skin. We've argued against it. We've argued the baby should be breastfed. We've argued that this shouldn't be. So this is a we've got this patchwork of inconsistent policies and the results confusion and potential trauma for women and their partners and not to mention the midwives who I see as the go between the policy makers and the women and their partners and that's sometimes incredibly stressful. So the aim of our study was to explore the experience of women uh, who were giving birth and managing those early days and months of motherhood during the COVID pandemic, as well as to look at midwifery students and midwives providing this care. And we started off with a small idea and it just kept growing. So we began with a, a, a small kind of New South Wales Victoria team, uh, and that was the Sphere team. We got a small grant. We were very excited. And then people like Professor Sue Kilday and Professor Suzanne King, who ran the big, the big flood studies, the Canadian ice storm studies, contacted us and said, hey, could we be involved? We think we could really really be part of this team and let's follow up what's happening to children who are when their mothers are pregnant and birthing during this time and so a huge team of psychologists psychiatrists um, obstetricians aboriginal um, workers because we want to look at aboriginal women particularly refugee women and migrant women and we just kept growing and we're now applying for more money to hopefully keep going and then new zealand joined us um, so new zealand had been the envy of the world and done incredibly well and I still think they are the envy of the world and of course they had a second wave and so now they're they're doing um, exactly the same study in New Zealand which is really exciting. I think one of the great things that's come out of COVID-19 is we've come out of our silos as researchers and we've all decided we need to work together and we're not hunkering down and going don't you look at my homework or my exam paper because you know you might steal my ideas. So the methodology is very much a mixed methods. We've done in-depth interviews with women across Australia, 18 women, 17 midwives, midwifery students, 10 midwifery students. We've also got this really innovative part of this study, which is called the Vocal App, which my brilliant PhD student Hazel Keedle has designed, where women just daily, weekly record into an app and all their data gets uploaded and we analyse that. And we've got seven women recording all through their pregnancy about how they feel and what they're experiencing. And we've also then launched the large pregnancy and postpartum survey, two months postpartum survey, and we've had over 5,000 women respond um, to that, which has been a mind blowing. And we're about to launch the six month follow up survey. 
So what did midwives tell us? Well, midwives told us that there were so many questions and so few answers at the beginning. Um, you know, am I giving the women the right information? I knew my MIDI stuff, that's fine. I keep women safe, but I had no idea. Women were asking me, do I need to go to work? Can I go to work? I'm working in early childhood. I'm a high-risk pregnancy. I was really anxious. I, I don't know what to say. And we were given some information, but was it actually correct? We didn't have a lot of infinite information. So there's a lot of anxieties around that. I'm sure many midwives out there are nodding their heads with this one. And then another, you know, the anxiety of those first few weeks. Um, they didn't know what to do. Is it going to work? Is it right? But then midwives sort of then really went into this, okay, now let's switch on another way of thinking about this. Let's let's calm down. Let's, you know, get on with the job. And it was interesting. I would describe the first wave that we experienced mostly in New South Wales. In fact, it all began about one kilometre from where I live and my husband works in the hospital where it all began. I think in that first wave, it was high anxiety and everyone was running on adrenaline. When Melbourne hit, the midwives have said to us, we just went from stress to, to depression because it was like, how much longer can we keep this going? So midwives said they're constantly apologising, apologising to women, trying to find out why information has changed, trying to relay it. And it just was this constant feeling of, of, of running behind and um, being the meat in the sandwich between management and directives and women. Uh, so a huge amount of stress. I do think we, and I know Billy will so beautifully talk about this, but I do think that when it's all over and done, I can see trauma emerging for midwives and we need to be there for them. And we need to make sure that we hold them up because they've done the most incredible job in the year that was supposed to be our year. We were supposed to be looked after in 2020 and we've done the looking after. So let's let's not forget that they still need looking after when we finish. PPE, as, as I've already described, huge variations on how people use them on what was accessible. For example, we're going to publish a study very shortly looking at privately practicing midwives. And, you know, those midwives had to go to Bunnings um, hardware store to get it. They even if they had visiting rights or clinical arrangements with hospitals, they were denied PPE. And then the most beautiful thing happened, which is consumers who went out and bought them PPE and dropped them at their doorsteps. So we saw some lovely acts, but also some real concern about how we view certain uh, activities of midwives and COVID worries. You know, I know when it first hit and my husband was coming home from the hospital where it was all blowing up, you know, I said, go sleep in another bed for a while. <laughs> because there was this real concern and then he used to come home he used to shower at work bring his clothes home put them in the washing machine so we've reorientated so much about how we function as as people with our families as well as within the workplace so what could management have done better and the, and the midwives have said you know more kindness more calmness more effort in making us calm really putting more effort into being positive and supporting us with calmness. We were doing an absolutely brilliant job. When you walk around and you put your staff down for standing too close together, that's just bullshit. We don't pull punches in Australia. So there was just no effort to boost morale and rally around to everybody together and say, we're doing, we're gonna be okay. And I was thinking sometimes we just need a pep talk, you know, a decent pep, pep talk. And there was this really interesting struggle that midwives went through and really feeling that they can't stop being midwives. So here's a, here's a midwife telling a story and she says, I'm a midwife, this stuff isn't going to stop the way I deliver care. You know, I had a woman who at 20 weeks after countless miscarriages, she had just gotten to 20 weeks, her cervix was shortening and opening, they could see the bulging forward is right. She and her husband were devastated. I knew I was breaking the 1.5 meter rule. I got in and I hugged them both. Like, I can't stop being human in this. I can't, you know, I didn't go into midwifery to say I'm so sorry behind a mask. You know, whether that was the right decision or the wrong decision, I don't know, but I would do it again. A lot of midwives I know take the same view that you're a midwife because you actually, you know, your philosophies align to it and you give a damn about women. And we heard some amazing stories of midwives who at that moment of crisis pulled that mask down to connect with people because they found it just so wrong to have that barrier between them. So what did women tell us? 
Well, we asked them at what point during your pregnancy were things the worst in months? And it's really quite fascinating when you look at this graph and you've got the obvious peak that happened, you know, in April, particularly, and then dying down in May. And then we've got our second wave, um, which was August. So this is the months that the women found uh, that were worst for them. And they very much mirror what was going on in Australia. And we asked them, have you ever suspected you or anyone else you've known personally has had COVID? And you can see a huge number of pregnant women. You know, we're talking about nearly 800 pregnant women suspected or felt that they knew someone who'd had COVID. And then we asked them if they'd been tested. And it's around 900 pregnant women in, the, in this study sample had been tested. And then we asked them, had you got a positive result? And five out of that whole number. And while that's a good thing, thank goodness, that's a great thing, the amount of stress that has been caused and what's that doing to that growing baby? What's that doing to that family? What are the potential ripples that are coming out of this? So telehealth has been a fascinating thing for me and I found in the interviews and in the survey some really interesting things happening. So, so this woman, you know, talks about a particular hospital doing a shit job. I've only had one physical examination and one telehealth and the telehealth, they couldn't get me off the phone fast enough. And another woman who said, I'm very satisfied there was no telehealth. So some models of care continued as business as usual, often continuity of midwifery models, and others only women had two face-to-face -face visits their whole pregnancy. And women talked about, you know, the remote visits are hard. No one appears to be checking up on me. And this woman said, I haven't had a face-to-face -face visit with a midwife yet, not until I'm 28 weeks. And what women said in the interviews, and, and I would ask them, how does the midwife speak to you? You know, are the midwives asking you about how you're going, what's going on with your family? And I know when I have women in, in my office, I spend 50 minutes of my one hour appointment with them talking or listening, chatting about life, dealing with questions and anxieties. And then we have 10 minutes where we do them, the baby heart and the blood pressure and everything. But what's happened is even in continuity care models, midwives are cutting to the chase. They're going straight into how's your baby? Is it moving? You know, here's your plan. This is what you need to do. And midwives have started to shelve the psychological support. Now, I find that fascinating. We're in a time where we didn't ever have to depend on telehealth as we do now. And I think we haven't prepared adequately to help midwives maximise this particular resource in this time. Continuity of care has very much come out in the um, study as a buffer. It's an absolute buffer. And here's this woman who I interviewed who said she went to hospital, she was shoved in a room, the isolation bay to be, you know, have all the screenings done. Her husband was removed from her. She was in pain. She was distressed. She was calling out. Nobody would come near her. And then her midwife walked in and she said, I just fell into my midwife's arms and everything was right from that moment on. And she very much talked about having a midwife who I could go to was like holding me up in a storm. So how do we really use telehealth? Now, all of the images when I went on the internet look like this. They look really warm and friendly and personal and there's faces and look at this doctor, he's, he's even zooming out of the screen to do a physical check. So they all symbolize connection and intimacy and functioning. However, the reality in Australia, and I don't know what it is in the UK, is most of it's been on the phone. It's not been about seeing people. It's been on a phone and it, looks very different to this. Now, I, I'm the first to say I think there are some people who really do benefit and like telehealth. I think there are groups of people who prefer not to have face to face or prefer not to have to come into the busy hospitals or have mental health issues that they actually are getting more engaged by using this medium. But I also think for many, many women who are pregnant, not having that personal, that person in there and that face face-to-face -face and eye-to-eye -eye contact is altering some of the way we provide care. So I want to just think a little bit about the reflections of, of following the birth. And I, I want to now go from all of that doom and gloom, and we're not, we all know the doom and gloom, to actually the consideration that it's not all bad. And I was really surprised when we did our survey. So when we when we constructed our survey, we constructed a survey to pick up everything that was possibly bad. And when we sent it to the women who we'd interviewed to pilot it, 
they kept coming back and going, well, it's too negative. There's some good things here. Why don't you ask about some of the positive things? And thank goodness, that's why you pilot surveys, because very, very clearly there were some positive things. So here is a question we asked in our survey. Um, did you consider any of the following positive regarding giving birth during the COVID pandemic? Check all that apply. So overwhelmingly in the interviews and in the survey, it was fewer visitors in the postnatal period and fewer visitors at home and in hospital. That has come out overwhelmingly. It's come out in the interviews. It's come out with the midwife interviews. It's come out with the student midwife interviews. I would say the universal truth we've learned from this is that we have burst the bubble and we need to go back to protecting the bubble of making families after birth. And um, that was a surprise to everybody. Um, also getting more time with midwives. So midwives would say to us, I can go into a room and I don't have to go, oh, I'll come back because somebody's there. They had the time, it was uninterrupted. Um, so, it was really interesting to see how widely that was identified as a positive. And the women said, you know, at first fewer visitors made me sad, but then I realized um, things were less rushed. I could focus on my baby, my husband worked from home and I had more support. We have done interviews with so many women who've said, oh my gosh, having my partner at home has been so nice. Because there is someone to leave the children with if you have to pop to the shops. There, he, he or she are, is home for the meal time, whereas before it would always be late and the kids would be in bed. So there have been some social changes that have actually been beneficial. And then women said, you know, time with no visitors in the hospital, just the husband and I turned out to be a blessing in disguise. We had ample of time to bond with our baby and develop skills and comfort as new parents. Um, and then th this woman who said, I had a difficult relationship with my family and the restrictions meant I had more control. Um, and this was life changing and our results were better as uh, our relationship was better as a result. So another question we asked is overall, would you say um, that what have been the positive, uh, what have been the consequences of COVID on your household? And we asked that from extremely positive to extremely negative. And you can see, while yes, the weight is on the negative, most definitely, there is a substantial number of women who are responding to this saying this actually has been a positive time for them. Now, we do know that there seems to be a rising report from many countries now that preterm birth has gone down. We have to do a lot more looking at that. You know, our women karma are women not so stressed by all of the rush and bustle are women actually doing the nesting that maybe is a very positive thing for them um, in their pregnancies and you know this woman talks about slowing down enjoying the simple things and time together having partners work at home has been really amazing can I just put a caveat around that of course, if there's domestic violence, this has been an incredibly dangerous time for women. So we've had rising reports of significant domestic violence. But where you have happy, stable families, this has been a positive thing. And, you know, me and my husband have discovered we're more resilient than we thought. We're a strong team. And I love this one. I fell in love with my husband during our hospital stay and we've connected deeper because we're the only ones we can see. That sounds funny after 14 years of marriage but it's true we've been able to connect deeper during the pregnancy and birth because it's just us so I think 2020 is revealing really interesting things to humanity and it's actually reminded us of what matters in this world and that's each other Media and social media is fascinating. It's both a curse and a blessing. And most of us who engage in it would have days where we feel it is both a curse and a blessing. But we actually wanted to find out what were women doing regarding media. And we, the average amount of time women were spending at the height of the pandemic watching news reports or social media was around three to four hours a day. And then I, I was just got this idea where I thought, I'm going to ask, have you consciously decided to reduce the time you spent? Because I found myself doing it. I thought, I'm saturated, I can't hear any more bad stuff, and I started shutting it off. And we were really interested to find out that a lot of women had consciously tried to distance themselves from the negativity out there. 
I want to talk a little bit about a paper who's, that has just literally been published in the last um, week that we've written in the Journal of, of um, Law and Medicine, and I've written this with two lawyers. Um, Bashi Kumar Hazard is the head of human rights, she's the director of human rights in childbirth, and Mary Tyrell is a long-time friend and a, and a brilliant uh, nursing lawyer, and she's um, deputy editor of this um of this um, journal. And so what we did is we, we wrote on how the COVID-19 um, pandemic highlights this ongoing pandemic of neglect and oppression when it comes to women's reproductive rights. And we addressed a whole lot of issues that you can see in the orange square over to the side. And I won't be going through all of those. It's a 10,000 word paper if you've got the stomach for it. So we're in an extraordinary situation where we have to balance human rights and human life. And that is a really extraordinary situation. And there is a fine line between human rights and human and, the, and a human right to live. And we must be forever vigilant to keep our eye on that line. Because at the times like this, we can encroach into rights without good reason. And we can actually pull back advancements in humanity significantly. So I so much see this with, with um, childbearing women because I think that is always a great vulnerability. And the COVID pandemic has exposed this neglect of women's reproductive rights, um, provision of abortion services and maternity care are classic. And a lot of historic oppressions have resurfaced, which we discussed in this paper, the opposition to home birth, the closure of birth centers, the removal of abortion services, restricting support people, banning water birth, skin to skin, some of those things that I've talked about um, already. And the lack of support for home birth and private midwifery has really exposed the Achilles heel. And of course, we've in Australia got more women choosing to free birth because we haven't got enough midwives who can provide that service. And we've moved to an electronic medium, but I'm already hearing the murmurs of, well, let's keep going this way. We don't actually have to bring the women in. We can do it all over the phone. We can do it all remotely. And I'm very concerned that we do not have the evidence that that's best. We're looking at the bottom line. We're looking at cost. And the Gutmacher um, Institute did an amazing study that was published um, this year, looking at if you had a 10% decline in access to care in 132 low and middle income countries, there was an estimated um, outcome that would be an additional 15 million unintended pregnancies leading to unsafe abortions. That's a thousand additional deaths from that. Uh, 1.7 million women and 2.6 million newborns experiencing major complications leading to 28,000 more maternal deaths and 168,000 newborn deaths. And the Glance at Global Health comment that was published warned that maintaining reproductive health care during COVID pandemic is not a luxury, but a matter of life and death. And I think it'll be in the next year or two, we'll see the full fallout of what has happened during this time. And that's not even to mention the human rights abuses that goes on in some countries. And here's a woman who was turned away um, from eight hospitals being in labour. And at the first hospital, the doctor told her, I'll slap you if you take your mask off. So what happens in crisis and emergency situations like this is we give a mandate to very problematic behaviour and we need to call it and we need to act on it. So why are women's rights the first to go? You know, in Australia, you can visit a pub, but your partner can't come to your antenatal appointments or scans. You can go shop at Ikea, but you can't have a second part, a birth partner at your baby's birth. And, and I find this quite extraordinary, the illogic. We can have a half-filled stadium in Australia for a football game. You know, we can have 100 people in pokey, playing the pokies in an RSL. And, you know, it really does make me think, you know, we've got a lot of white old men making decisions about women's business. And I think we have to constantly call it. We have to challenge it. Now, I'm not anti, I am not an anti-mask person. I, I, I absolutely believe in, in the, the logic and the evidence around it. I also believe in, the, in, in lockdowns when they're needed and in restricting our contact with other people. But I think there's some illogic here that for me smacks of patriarchy and agenda and bias. And what are the ripples of trauma that will come out of that time? And that's something we're going to try and assess as well in our study. But here's this woman who said, I gave birth alone. I was then in hospital with my newborn alone. This isn't something someone should feel forced into doing alone. So 
what can we learn? What are the lessons to learn for next time? And these are some of my kind of top ones coming out of this, this study we've been doing. Childbirths, a, psych, a physiological, social, psychological, cultural and spiritual event caught up in a medicalized net and hence so often ends up in a position it should not be. Continuity of care is a buffer and we need to start to really look at its potential in emergency situations. If you don't have the evidence, don't make the rule. Bottom line, be cautious, but don't go making laws because you just think it might be a good idea. Community-based care should be prioritised, not minimised. This is when primary health care comes into its own. This is when a public health strategy is absolutely fundamental. Telehealth's great, but for whom and who sh and how should we use it? And I think we need to do a lot more research on that. And beware the change that now stays without good evidence of benefit and acceptability. And I want to end on a positive note. And I want to just say to you all, go gently, my friends. Um, listen to the birds, feel the breeze on your skin, the sun on your face, and let the moonbeams dance in your eyes. The world is still on her axis and the seasons are changing. Now is just now. It is not forever. Tomorrow is coming. Try to focus on those positive things. We will get through this and we will be wiser and stronger, I believe, as a society if we're willing to take the lessons from this. And I want to end with this picture because my dear, dear friend Fiona Haynes is online. She actually got in, registered to be come onto this program to listen to me speak. Fiona is my mum's best friend and she is one of the original midwives from the actual Nanata's house from Call the Midwives and she worked with Jennifer Work and my mum and her work together in the Docklands of England. And this is us going and finding the real um, Nonata's house, which is actually St. Frideswide's mission a few years ago, knocking on the door, going in, and she showed me all of the rooms um, that they used to live in. It's now actually a, uh, a, a housing place for, for homeless people, I think, and, and disadvantaged people. And we spent the most gorgeous day together. But she's my youngest, oldest friend, and... Um, I just wanted to end by saying, hi, Fiona, I love you. And one of the worst things about 2020 has not been able to go into England, spend time having cups of tea, watching Midsummer murders and uh, going to see the beautiful flowers and gardens of England. And that's it for me. Thank you. <laughs>